Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Jim Curtin, Chief Business and Government Relations Officer at Ascenda Integrated Health, headquartered in Glassboro, New Jersey. A good morning and welcome to our panelists, our very esteemed group of uh, speakers today and, and panelists, and to all of you out there concerned with behavioral health as we hopefully come out of the pandemic uh, and struggle to find normalcy in our lives. And, and I think we all yearn for the way life used to be. On behalf of the Ascenda Board of Trustees and our CEO, Dr. DeFabio, we're so excited to bring together some of the best minds across our country when it comes to behavioral health. And at a time when pinpointing, pinpointing solutions to the ongoing mental health crisis in the US is so desperately, desperately needed. The entire country has seen a wave of behavioral health issues as a result of the pandemic. The numbers are startling. I don't believe anybody can deny the numbers are startling, whether you're looking at anxiety or depression, um, emergency room visits, fatal overdoses. And when it comes to our youth, the numbers are even worse. That's why we're gathered here this morning with our esteemed panelists. Just a little housekeeping before we start. Each speaker will make a brief opening statement. Please refer to the chat room. You'll see a link there for the full bios on each of our accomplished speakers. Our, accomplished, our speakers are so very accomplished that if I read each bio, it would take up our entire hour this morning. So that just doesn't make sense. Uh, participants are asked to use the Q&A features to ask questions of the panelists immediately following the last speaker's uh, brief opening statement. We're going to switch uh, to roundtable discussion where I'll be uh, asking questions posed by our panelists, uh, by our participants uh, in the Q&A function. So please use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions. Um, and so our sp first speaker is uh, Congressman Patrick J. Kennedy. During his time in Congress, Patrick J. Kennedy was the head and lead author of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which requires insurers to cover treatment for mental health and substance use disorders no more restrictively than they would for physical health issues such as ca uh, cancer and diabetes. Patrick founded the Kennedy Forum, which is a nonprofit that unites advocates, business leaders, and government agencies to advance evidence-based practices and programming in mental health and addiction. In 2015, Kennedy co-authored the New York Times bestseller, A Common Struggle. And in 2017, Congressman Kennedy was appointed to the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and the Opioid Crisis. I'll turn it over to you, Congressman. Thank you so much, Jim, and thank you to Ascenda for convening this important discussion to be able to join my uh, friends and colleagues and, and my wife to have this conversation. So um, as a way of perspective, uh, when we did the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, we framed it in the, in the way that really this whole issue needs to be framed. And that is for too long, mental health has been treated as something separate from healthcare. It's been carved out, siloed, and put to the side. And our goal now in the years ahead is to reintegrate mental health with the rest of the healthcare system. And in doing so, we need to bring access to mental health and quality uh, mental health to people who need it. And now, of course, more than ever post COVID, as we've seen this impact of COVID uh, really uh, raise the rates of people who are suffering. So the real job for us in this conversation we're going to have today is how do we integrate all the things that are going to be influential in people's mental health? Because we're not just looking at this as a clinical issue. We need more psychiatrists. We need better medications. We need better therapy. We need evidence of cognitive behavioral therapy across all different diagnoses. We need to translate that. We need to get telemental health and but what we also need is we need to understand the impacts of economic security, which of course has really been a, a real influence of people's um, mental health. We need to know the impact of supportive housing. We need to know the impact of a purpose-driven life, um, an opportunity to work in an employment that people feel connected to and part of, and that 
supports them in their recovery. So there are so many pieces to this. I know my wife's going to be talking about the piece of real prevention and public health begins with school-based mental health, because ultimately we need to start early and give young people that guidebook that uh, folks like myself who are in recovery always say, like, we wish we had had the guidebook on how to manage stress and live life and make better decisions. In the future, we need to introduce neuroliteracy so people understand their brains when they're in school, understand their amygdalas, understand how stress impacts them in a very negative way if they don't learn how to cope with it. We do all those things. We can really build a future where we have less of a burden of mental health on, on this country. And, and that will be the best investment we can make because we really can't treat our way out of this problem. It's getting to be so big. And so, and I would finally say the biggest dilemma we have today, and frankly, going forward, is a workforce issue. And I know you have, you have Chuck Ingolia from the National Council on, which is really at the forefront of advocating for these big systemic issues. And I think workforce is top amongst those, because without uh, the, uh, an adequate workforce, we can't even begin to meet the need. Technology is great but it, it's not going to substitute for having more people uh, to help out. Um, but anyway, thanks again, Jim, and I'll turn it back to you. Thanks so much, Congressman. Really appreciate your, your remarks. Um, our next speaker uh, is Mr. Coderre. Tom Coderre is the Acting Deputy Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use with decades of public, private, and nonprofit experience. Tom is the first person in recovery to lead SAMHSA. His career has been significantly influenced by his personal journey and a philosophy that acknowledges the essential role peer recovery support services play in helping people with mental and substance use disorders rebuild their lives. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tom. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. It's an honor uh, to, just, to join this distinguished panel. Uh, this morning representing SAMHSA and our Assistant Secretary, Dr. Miriam Delphi-Rittman. Um, there's lots of things I could talk about uh, this morning, uh, but I only have a couple minutes. So I thought I would share a little bit about one of SAMHSA's uh, upcoming priorities, the launch of 988. And I have a few slides that I would love to share just to guide me in my conversation this morning. So let me do that real quick here. Hopefully everyone can see these slides. Uh, as you can see from this first slide, um, there are some really urgent realities driving the need for crisis transformation across our country. Uh, and these statistics here underscore the harsh truth. Too many people are experiencing uh, suicidal crisis, mental health or substance use related distress without the support and care that they need as Patrick talked about. And sadly, uh, the pandemic uh, just like you mentioned, Jim, has only made a bad situation worse when it comes to mental health and wellness in America. Um, yet there's hope. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline works. Uh, it provides 24-7 free and confidential support to people in suicidal crisis or mental health-related distress, helps thousands of people overcome crisis situations every day. And on January, on July, rather not January, on July 16th of 2022, uh, the United States is going to transition to using the 988 dialing code, a three-digit dialing code for the first time ever as an easier way to reach the existing lifeline. And it's also not just an easier way to reach the lifeline. It's a, it's a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to expand and, um, and to really uh, increase the amount of behavioral health crisis services that we have through this life-saving network. Uh, 988 is more than just an easy number to remember. It serves as a universal entry point so that no matter where you live, you can reach a trained crisis counselor who can help. While this is an exciting time to reimagine how we provide crisis services in our country, the full vision of a transformed crisis system with 988 at its core is not gonna be built overnight. Um, transformation on this scale is gonna take time uh, and we must all work together to make this happen. It's gonna require continued collaboration, commitment, uh, and support to make it an effective, appropriate, and sustainable, uh, both for the public and private sectors. 
In order to see our vision and goals become a reality, uh, we're focused on four primary functions, or we call them pillars. Um, these are core to our success. Short term, we're looking to strengthen and expand the current Lifeline call center infrastructure and, 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 and the capacity that we have there to ensure trained crisis councils are available to quickly respond to 988 via call, text, or chat. Longer term, um, our vision is really to build a robust crisis response system across the country that links our callers to the community-based providers who are going to be the ones who are going to deliver that full range of crisis care services, just like Ascenda. You know, um, this is more uh, a more robust system, um, and it's going to be essential to meeting crisis care uh, needs uh, across, you know, into the future. Currently, these crisis care services don't exist in all areas of our country. And it's gonna take time and sustained support to, uh, for this crisis system to evolve. So we envision a day when people across our country will have someone to call, someone to respond, and a safe place to go for crisis care. This graphic highlights crisis lines are a critical component of a crisis, a comprehensive crisis uh, and effective mental health crisis response system. It's important to emphasize that uh, the crisis uh, contact alone can be an effective intervention. When other crisis services are needed, the crisis centers work in concert with these other service elements to coordinate care. Uh, the follow-up and wraparound linkage is particularly critical in promoting engagement and preventing uh, repeated cycling through crisis, uh, through, the, through crises. Um, through effective 988 implementation and broader crisis system development, millions of individuals in crisis can receive the support and linkage each year, resulting, and this is the important stuff, right, in decreased suicides, decreased hospitalizations, um, better engagement with mental health services, and less interaction with law enforcement. Uh, success really requires a federal investment in leadership, uh, which we are very fortunate to have, in partnership with states, territories, and tribal nations to ensure adequate system capacity and to support coordinated, equitable, person-centered care. Um, clearly, we can't do it alone though. Um, and these are just a few of the partners who've been working alongside us at SAMHSA to, pre to prepare for that transition to 988. Through a series of recent convenings, we've been working with partners across a number of sectors involved in implementing 988 in states and communities across the country to assess readiness, develop roadmaps for 988 implementation, and measure progress and, and so much more. Um, we've made significant progress in the past uh, six months. Uh, we've completed some important reports to Congress, one of which you can find on our 988 webpage uh, related to 988 appropriations. And we've also recently announced funding to help transition, uh, help uh, and shore up and staff up the lifeline, including 105 million available to states and territories for staffing crisis call centers. We have more work uh, ahead of us as we move closer to the transition of 988 on July 16th of 2022. Uh, and we look forward to our continued efforts with all of our partners getting there. Again, thanks so much for letting me be here today. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions during the Q&A period. Thanks so much, Tom. And a reminder to our participants uh, to please use the Q&A function uh, to pose questions uh, to the panelists. Amy Kennedy. Amy is the Education Director of the Kennedy Forum, where she pursues partnerships and collaborations that emphasize evidence-based research and programming to facilitate policy change in the areas of education and mental health. With over 15 years of experience working in public schools, Amy has seen firsthand how a child's mental health and mental health literacy impacts their ability to learn and to grow, not only in the classroom, but in life. Amy serves on the boards of Mental Health America, a leading national advocacy organization, and Parity.org, which promotes gender parity at the highest levels of business. Thank you, Amy. Oh, thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate this conversation today. And you know, the way that you're framing this and kind of the whole landscape that we're looking at. I've been focused on mental health in schools uh, really since my own time in the classroom, obviously the influence of Patrick on my thinking as a teacher really changed my perspective. As a 
teacher it, working in New Jersey schools for a decade, I had not had training in any aspect of mental health or the behavior challenges that I was seeing in the classroom. And it really was an eye-opening experience to me and something that I'd like to see more teachers have a chance to learn about and be trained in. We know how difficult their jobs have been over the pandemic, but this isn't something new. To truly help youth nationwide, we have to come together to prioritize prevention and early intervention, early identification and treatment in primary care settings and in school. I've experienced firsthand how children's mental health impacts their ability to learn and grow. There were kids in my classroom that I could see were struggling and it was reflected in not only behaviors in class, their grades, their outcomes, and yet we know that many kids, when, when they first start to show symptoms to when they actually receive treatment can be a decade of time. During my time at MHA, the slogan's always been before stage four. We don't wanna wait until it gets to crisis till we need to call 988 for us to receive treatment. We wanna start those responses early and have better outcomes. The results and the delays are right in front of our eyes. With all of those increases that you heard in Tom's presentation about the number of suicides, the rates of depression, um, anxiety on the rise, we know that this is something that we have to address immediately, that it has been declared a state of emergency for youth mental health, and that much of the funding that has been designated from uh, ESSER funds are in the hands of superintendents now and they need direction. They need guidance and they need that sustainability for funding to be able to plan and implement systems of care through our school system where kids spend most of their day. So although the money has been allocated, uh, there's a lot that we still need to do to help set up not only in New Jersey, but across the country, what the next steps should be. I worked with Hopeful Futures Campaign. It's a coalition of many organizations and they've created a scorecard for uh, states to look at in how they could lay out our path forward in terms of policy and created buckets to help assess where each state currently sits. It uh, identifies things like prevention and curriculum, the ratio of school counselors and other mental health professionals, available training for educators and all staff, things like sustainable funding and grant programs that have already been set up, and screenings and early intervention that could be uh, put into place. So we're really excited that states are already starting to use this to create policy and to move forward policy that's been languishing. Thanks so much, Amy. And we, we know clearly that school-based uh, mental health services have to really be at the, the foundation of a new vision for behavioral health. And we know you've been all over that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chuck Ingolia. Chuck is the president and the CEO of the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, where he leads the national charge to ensure people have access to quality, affordable mental health and addiction services. To accomplish this, he harnesses the voices and support of more than 3,000 National Council members who serve over 10 million individuals. Chuck, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jim, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with what uh, such an amazing panel of folks. We're so grateful for Tom and his leadership at SAMHSA and all the great work uh, that Patrick and Amy do. And Suzanne, what a pleasure to get to meet you as well. Um, you know, at least once a month, I get a call from somebody trying to find treatment for a friend or a loved one. Maybe somebody on this phone recently texted me on a weekend looking for a referral. Uh, a few months before, it was the wife of the mayor of one of the largest cities in the United States looking for a referral uh, to care. And I frequently leave those conversations wondering, does this make any sense <laughs> that in a country as wealthy 
as ours that spends so much on health care, the average person has absolutely no idea where to access mental health and addiction treatment. And that's really the goal that the National Council has been trying to address for 14 years with the vision that Patrick has laid out, right? We need to be part of healthcare to be treated like healthcare. And that starts with having a common idea of what access and quality, the service array looks like. And we've been so proud to have been working now for 14 years on an idea that is finally gaining traction of having uh, an entity in every community that is available 24 seven that serves you regardless of your ability to pay insurance coverage or diagnosis called a certified community behavioral health clinic. And while it's not the best acronym that ever existed, the idea is really important uh, that everybody can show up, get assessed and get care. We're so grateful for the president calling uh, for the permanent expansion of CCBHCs and so much attention that has been put forward by Congress. And we're hoping that we're at the cusp of making this the transition from a temporary limited demonstration to a nationwide program because everyone in this country, no matter where they live, deserves access to quality care. And we never could have conceptualized 14 years ago when we began this journey that we would be on the cusp of a nationwide three-digit number for people to reach out for care. And that's going to require capacity in communities. And this, we think, is a perfect marriage of CCBHCs and 988 really can complement each other. So I'm looking forward to questions today, but I would encourage folks uh, to uh, go to the National Council website to learn more about CCBHCs and most importantly, to be engaged with your, your members of Congress to demand that people have access to care and to ask them to be part of that solution. Thank you, Chuck. And, and um, just to give the conference a little plug, we're, we're looking forward to DC, uh, being at the MGM Grand in DC for a conference for the National Council on Mental Well-Being, where I believe you expect a, 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 about 4,000 participants. God uh, willing, we're hoping it, be, it is true. That's great to see. I'm very much looking forward to it. Our next speaker is Suzanne Kunis. Suzanne is the Vice President of Behavioral Health Solutions for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield in New Jersey. She brings over 30 years of experience in the healthcare industry with significant focus on behavioral health. Suzanne is a registered nurse and moved from care delivery to health management early in her career. Suzanne, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jim. And thanks for the invitation to be part of this esteemed panel. My colleagues here have such amazing experience and have such made such incredible contributions to the field. So I am honored to be here. And Chuck, I just have to comment, the CCBHC model is incredible. We are huge supporters and have actually used a bit of a modified version of that to do some of the work that we're doing. And, and we are total advocates. So, so thanks so much for all the work that's been done there. So I'm absolutely thrilled to see that behavioral health is finally being recognized as a, such a critical part of the healthcare system, finally. And that integration and whole person health is job one. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Having said that, you all have asked me to talk about value-based care and what an organization can do to prepare for it. In the physical health world, value-based care is a common practice. Contracting arrangements have been placed for years. Behavioral health has been way behind the curve. It's definitely picked up speed and there's a lot that providers can do to get ready. So we're gonna move from the old world, the old world of fee for service as a reimbursement model, really translated to providers saying, do more, make more. We moved to managed care and what did that do for providers? It's do less and make more. But now value-based care is really about doing better and making more. And that's really how we're structuring what we're doing going forward. The goal of value-based care is to focus on patient-centered care and care coordination, taking essentially what's a fragmented system and making it whole, focusing on quality, outcomes, efficiency, and effectiveness of treatment. And the goal is to keep people healthy and in the community, focusing on improving the quality of their life 
and lowering by doing all the right things, the total medical cost. So for value-based care, how do you measure success? Well, it's things like reducing institutional or inpatient care. It's lowering emergency room usage. It's delivering health services within an integrated and connected delivery system. It's identifying and managing high risk or high cost, high cost individuals and improving value. All that sounds great, but how do you do it? And to me, it's three basic things, people, process, and technology. From a people perspective, this is probably the most important component we have here. There has to be a cultural shift in practice, and it starts at the top with the leadership. Payment will ultimately be made based on outcomes and less on volume as the fee-for-service world has done historically. It's a big step, and it's a big leap. From day one, team members really need to understand what the expectations are. I know the organization will be incentivized to achieve improved patient outcomes, and that'll hopefully incentives will hopefully trickle down to everybody in your organization. There needs to be top-down education and commitment to make the move, but it is going to happen, and you want to be ready. From a process standpoint, again, moving away from fee-for-service to fee-for-value. Value-based care allows providers to render evidence-based services that they believe are most clinically appropriate to get the best outcomes for that individual. Most health plans are moving to behavioral health payment models that reward quality improvement over time. An example, and many of my friends on the phone here are involved in this, we have implemented an integrated system of care program. And again, loosely based on the CCBHC model, bringing it to commercial insured members. We have bundled rates and those rates are established based on the intensity of services that are provided. So there are, are low rates for low touch types of services, medium, and then high for those patients who have greater need for support. And it allows providers to actually use the fees to pay for what they need to do to get a patient well and stay well. It's not a bill by procedure code scenario, it's bundled services. Employing the principles of measurement-based care will be critical to your success in the value-based world. What's what is measurement-based care? It's the practice of basing clinical care on client, client data, collect it throughout treatment. It's how you take care of a patient based on their unique situation. It decreases the likelihood of deterioration in treatment, which as you know, drives cost to care. Are you set up to meet HEDIS requirements? Those are standards that have been set by the National Committee for Quality Assurance and health plans are required and monitored in terms of how compliant we are in meeting those standards. We look to our provider partners to achieve those goals and in fact, we'll incentivize providers around those goals. Examples include, how quickly did we follow up with an individual after an, uh, an emergency department visit or a hospitalization? What are we doing in the area of medication adherence? That's a huge issue. Monitoring and managing compliance can have a significant impact on that patient's outcome. So additional considerations, can you move to a care team approach? For example, therapist, psychiatric or prescriber consultant, care coordinator, peers and coaches. You wanna let licensed staff operate at the top of their license and allow other team members to focus on care coordination and ongoing support, which is crucial to great outcomes. And that all translates into a more efficient and effective care process. Are you employing evidence-based practices, clinical and non-clinical solutions? Example, someone with opioid use disorders, the gold standard treatment, medication-assisted treatment, suboxone, for example, with adjunctive services to support that whole person. What if I tell you that we monitor a set of providers in the state and around the country, and we find that less than 20% of the time, patients with opioid disorders we used to search, we're put on medication-assisted treatment. Do we expect 100%? No, but we're a far cry from where we need to be. That's evidence-based best practices. This is not evidence-based care the way we're talking about today. Integrating with primary care practices, we're talking integration, whole person care. This is where everything is headed and honestly, it can't happen soon enough. Reducing the stigma associated with behavioral health and treating people in the mainstream, mind and body as they should be. We need the community to break down those barriers and establish relationships with primary and specialty care providers in the interest of the patient. We wanna treat people, not conditions. You might wanna consider if you haven't already done so, establishing formal or informal relationships with other community providers and local health systems that are principles of whole person care. Does your practice routinely and periodically screen patient status with validated screening tools? Do you act accordingly in terms of, of your care plan? 
Are you using the data that you captured to manage your practice? 5% of people account for 80% of medical costs. Those are the patients that need the most attention. Not everybody needs to be seen every week. And some of these high need, high cost patients need to be seen several times a week, some once a month. Data monitoring, of, uh, data and monitoring of key indicators and then acting based on what the data says is gonna drive your success. That's the beauty of value-based care. It allows you to stratify your patients by level of care attention that they need and to treat them accordingly. And then lastly, on a technology front, electronic data capture, clearly measurement-based care relies on solid tracking and monitoring activities. You need technology to make that happen efficiently and effectively. Connect data to action. So by tracking patient status, you can avoid escalations, employ interventions that'll keep them from going to the emergency department or to a hospital admission. Consider an electronic medical record if you don't already have one that will allow you to not only have visibility into that patient's care at any point in time, but with patient consent, it'll allow you to coordinate care with other providers within the ecosystem, such as their physical health providers or specialists, and that'll lead to better patient outcomes. Do you provide virtual care in addition or in lieu of traditional brick and mortar services? That gives you the flexibility to support a patient in time of need and avoid an escalation without having to worry about getting them into an office or get, sending them to an emergency room for an evaluation. And do you employ technology, CBT, for example, to support patients between treatments that will support their continued improvement? So value-based care is coming, it's here and it's staying. Uh, will it solve all the ills in the behavioral health space? Absolutely not, but it's a great starting point. We've got a lot of work to do, all of us. Uh, we wanna partner with the provider community to help everyone succeed. It's about helping people live their best lives, right? So that's what we all want. And it's a journey, not a sprint, but we're gonna get there. There's a huge amount of literature and resources out there around moving to value-based care, as well as the details of measurement-based care. There's a lot to be learned from the physical health side of medicine. Those lessons learned could be valuable tools to begin your journey. So I wish you all a lot of luck, a lot of success in making that, that journey. And we're here to help along the way, and we will be doing so. But I want to thank you for your time today and look forward to answering questions. Thanks so much, Suzanne, and thanks to all of our panelists. Uh, it, it's pretty clear that, that there's a lot of agreement uh, in, in what a new vision for behavioral health really needs to look like in our country. So we're going to move to questions. The questions are starting to come in now fast and furiously. So we're going to get to as, as many as we can, I, I promise. The first question um, is, what do you see in the future for breaking down the silos of our educational system and forging an integration of mental health, schools, and even primary care? Anybody want to take a crack at that? <laughs> um, well, Jim, I think, you know, Suzanne brought up uh, some really important points. One, talking about electronic health records, knowing that we could do a lot to uh, integrate these services into schools, have schools as a site of service and be able to treat students where they are. Uh, both through telemental health and having clinicians in the building, as well as, as Suzanne mentioned, having people work up to their credentials. So even school counselors who um, right now may be doing other things like administrative tasks or uh, career planning instead of working with our youth who are struggling, that might be an important move. But being able to help reduce some of those barriers means that we have to look at how we set up those community uh, partnerships or have schools have public private partnerships and really expand that access. And once we're able to uh, do that, we also have to consider that there is a cost to that technology. And so funding that through our state, making sure there is sustainable funding for those programs. Uh, we saw a model in Michigan where they set aside funding for a technology platform that allowed both screenings as well as connection to uh, providers right from the school and keeping those health records all in one place. And then the schools are able to interact and refer out to those providers. So 
that kind of coordination is really important and will need to be done through a sustainable funding um, program. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. The next question is uh, specifically for Amy and Chuck. So maybe Chuck will let you start off on, yeah. on this one, if you don't mind. It says, um, we're a CCBHC and it's a terrific model, but we also have early childhood programs that have proved early intervention is best begun at the preschool level. Are there models being considered for expanding a CCBHC-like initiative to early childhood uh, intervention? Well, that's a, an interesting question, and maybe we could follow up online because I don't see why we couldn't do that. You know, with you know, with the current model, um, and, but I'd love to have that conversation. And I think one of the things that's exciting to me about uh, CCBHC is the flexibility that it provides organizations to uh, place um, employees where they're most needed and to uh, create. Uh, effective partnerships. So I'd be look. I'd look forward to learning more about the particular challenges that you're experiencing and and brainstorming uh, um, uh, solutions. Thanks so much, Chuck. Next question, um, maybe uh, best posed to uh, Congressman Kennedy. Um, the question is: What are the best practices for ensuring equity in access to mental health treatment on a community and state level? So this is really the new frontier for mental health is how do we understand how to measure all of these complementary systems in terms of the impact. Really what Ascenda does is you help coalesce the systems that are traditionally not thought of as part of mental health, but have an essential role to play in supporting mental health. We really don't have that mapped out or understood. Of course, we don't really track data, just like Suzanne was talking about data. We not only need to track it in a kind of EMR um, way that tracks the integration with the rest of medical care, but we gotta track it just in general, because as Suzanne said, we need to treat people, not just their diagnoses. And in order to understand what works best for people, you know, maybe it's that intervention, as we spoke about earlier about housing, um, you know, supportive employment, things of that sort. That's going to be what we need to understand uh, better. So to, to kind of answer the question, <clears throat> you're asking the right question. We don't have the answers yet, but we need to set up a process where we can really measure and understand the attribution of various integrations on the outcomes and we don't really have that. You know, we have the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And I am, I'm sure Tom Sampsa is probably taking the deepest dive in kind of how SDOH stuff really impacts outcomes. But that's really what I think the question's getting at. I'll yeah, turn it I, over I, to you, Tom. Yeah, just to jump in uh, quickly, we, we, you know, at Sampsa, we have an office of behavioral health equity um, that is looking at a lot of uh, these practices to. Uh, we're doing um, disparity impact statements as part of our grants. We're also, um, you know, uh, helping uh, community-based organizations um, really understand how to do this work uh, at the community level. You know, we have a project called our, our, our National Network to End Disparities, which is working with community-based organizations uh, to help ensure equity and access. Uh, a lot of times, small community-based organizations um, who work um, in under-resourced uh, communities uh, don't have the access to federal grant dollars. And it's because they just don't have, you know, maybe they don't have the relationships with states who get the formula-based grants. Maybe they don't have grant writers on staff who can apply for grants like SAMHSA grants, which can oftentimes be cumbersome. So we're, we're, we understand that and we're working with them to try to advance that uh, further. I think Tom, for this, Jim, you could put in the chat or afterwards send to the participants information on all those programs Tom just mentioned. It's really impressive what SAMS is doing to push the envelope. You know, we understand what evidence base is in clinical. We don't understand what evidence base is in practice, especially for communities of color and the impact of other 
um, supports that need to be better understood if we're to really meet people where they are. And, and this whole new initiative, as you talked about, Tom, uh, on uh, disparity impact, that's a really big new notion, like how are we seeing implicit bias within the delivery of mental health care such that communities of color, which are often, you know, left out, are continuing to be left out. But but thanks to Mary. Yeah, you're right. Written. You're right. Because no, you're right. Because oftentimes we measure, um, you know, we measure demographic information. Right. We get, uh, you know, we get feedback about who's participating in our programs. But we don't get the when you drill down, Patrick, like you talked about, um, we don't get to the why. Um, and we don't get to, and so what we're hoping to do, uh, this is a huge priority for this administration. We're hoping uh, to drill down to the why and help people kind of bridge that gap. Thank you, Congressman, and, and thanks, Tom. And certainly uh, equity has got to be right at the heart of, of what we do as we, we move and unfold our new vision. So the next question um, I'm going to throw out and uh, to the panelists, it says many behavioral health providers are experiencing long waiting lists and issues with timely access of services, obviously being a workforce issue that Congressman Kennedy indicated. What are some of the solutions to this ever growing issue? And, and I think I think it was the Congressman who said during his remarks that this might be the greatest issue where we're facing now the workforce issue. It's certainly a top three issue, if not the greatest. So I'm gonna throw that out to the panelists and whoever wants to jump in and, and respond to that on potential solutions on the workforce problem. I'm happy to start if that, or to Patrick, uh, I'll, oh, no, Chuck. I, I will always okay. defer to you. No, uh, this, is, this is your thing. This is what you guys focus on. Yeah, I, mean, I, I wish that there was a simple answer to this, uh, you know, complex problem. Um, and we're trying to look at it from multiple perspectives. One is the, uh, how do we retain folks uh, who are currently uh, in our system? And we are working with, um, Congress to uh, try to create uh, retention payments uh, for behavioral health workforce. I think we've got to look at then the pipeline as well. How do we get more people interested uh, and can loan repayment? And we're looking at both existing federal loan repayment programs as well as trying to be creative. Are there other ways that other kinds of loan repayment that we could offer? There's uh, interest right now. I think New Jersey has a social impact uh, loan repayment program for certain professionals. Can we replicate that model uh, for behavioral health? And fundamentally also is we know that we have to look at rates, you know, because let's not pretend that how much you get paid doesn't influence where you work. And so those are the beginning ways that we're thinking about this um, and, uh, you know, certainly welcome other uh, ideas. Thanks very much, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you for those words of wisdom. And thanks so much. And the next question is a New Jersey specific question. So I apologize for those of you who are dialing in from other states. And Suzanne, I believe this question is, is best posed to you. It says, as New Jersey moves to carving in behavioral health services for our family care population, what can Horizon do to advocate with its peer HMOs for universal credentialing and to uniform rates that cover the cost of care? So we, we are part of a, the New Jersey Association of Health Plans and all the health plans are included in that. So as we, as we look toward the carving in, if you will, to the MCOs, the benefit, we are all trying to work together. I think we run into some challenges. We're not, in the world we live in today, we are not able to share rates with each other. So that's, that's a big challenge there. Um, but I think what happens is it all sorts to level out as programs go live and everyone, we get feedback from providers saying, Hey, you guys are paying way less than these folks or, and so it levels out over time, but unfortunately we are not in a position that we're able to have a uniform rate unless it was dictated by the state, for example. But, um, but we definitely are trying to influence and, and act across the system. And, and the JAMA just hosted a conference the other day. And this was one of the topics that all the MCOs were present for and talked about collectively how we're all trying to prepare for this because we wanna make this, again, when you get to talk about holistic people, this is a major first step 
and one in which we really are looking to do all the right things to help members to get what they need and, and live their best life. Thank you. Thanks very much. The next question is, how do we put incentives together for schools to empower them to service children and families in crisis to ensure that teachers can teach and we have school-based 24-7 services for children and their families to address their mental health and substance abuse problems that their families are experiencing? That's a that's a that's a, a a mouthful, but I I think we get kind of get the intent of the of the question. Um, we you know we all understand that the need is there, and having worked in the school building, you know, a desire to want to help our students and their families. It, it's there. It's figuring out how to navigate that that the schools are having trouble with. So if we wanna incentivize schools to be able to do more of this work, we need to simplify the billing processes for schools, make it possible for them to do that. We're talking a lot about how to expand Medicaid to students who do not have an IEP, because particularly now we know that not all students that are struggling are going to have an IEP. Many have developed new symptoms, uh, throughout COVID or there's a backlog for IEPs. So if we're able to take advantage of the uh, reversal that happened in 2014 in New Jersey and do that state plan amendment here to expand Medicaid to all Medicaid eligible students, that'll be one piece. However, in New Jersey specifically, we have a lot of really small districts and the paperwork for filing for those it's really onerous on those superintendents and that school staff. And so how do we simplify the billing for, for all people who are trying to do this work to make it easier so that schools can actually take advantage of the funds that are available? There's also grant programs like SAMHSA offers Project Aware, and so many schools rely on that. But knowing that there is funding a funding stream designated for this, that it is not optional, um, for example, through those ESSER funds where the money could be spent on mental health instead of it should be spent on mental health. That would incentivize schools into really using these funds um, on all the pieces that could in, involve families and really trying to underline that, underscore that part that says there has to be a family component because we know if a child is struggling, the whole family is struggling. You know, there isn't a parent who has a young person in their life that's struggling that doesn't feel that crisis themselves. And so being able to really incentivize that in that way, I think where it has to be a piece, and that is challenging. I will tell you that all school districts have a difficult time engaging with parents. And so bringing in that piece, and that may mean that they have to do a lot for the cultural competence of the school to be able to also the linguistic competence to make sure that they can offer things in languages for parents to be able to engage and caregivers to engage, that the hours um, of the services provided are flexible. So they may need those community providers to be able to offer things outside of the time frame that are typical school hours. And when we think about things like telemental health that allow somebody to dial in, are we covering audio? Because not everybody has access to video. Are we going to continue those things that make it easy for family members to participate? And those um, I believe would really be helpful. And uh, these screenings that could happen and involve parents whether it's through the pediatrician's office as is being proposed in Delaware or at the school really um, will keep us all aware of what's going on with our young people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Next question says, talking about patient-centered care, at the very core of this is a stable home for the patient. The evidence is clear that the most successful patient outcomes for chronic revolving door high utilization patients comes from those who are in a stable living situation. How is housing going to be addressed in the value-based 
patient-centric service delivery model? So uh, I'll jump in there. You know, ultimately, we were talking earlier about a CCBHC model, Chuck, for kids and early um, childhood. We need a CCBHC model for the justice-involved population because, unfortunately, a lot of people get cycled in and out of jail because of their untreated mental illness. And there's a lot of money tied up in our criminal justice system that could be freed up to help people with what their real needs are and that are to deal with their mental health and addiction challenges. So uh, I think the models that we've seen, for example, in Miami-Dade, where they were about to build a new jail because the population was growing so much, they managed to divert the dollars they had put into a bond to build the new jail into supportive housing and community supports. And guess what? They didn't have to build the new jail because they couldn't fill the new jail since they had you know, about 30% of the revolving population were all, you know, incarcerated because violation of parole, tracking, bunch of misdemeanors, and, and that clogs up the justice system, but it also costs a ton of money. And if we could use it to supportive housing and then bring in the clinical care, that's the magic uh, answer. And unfortunately, the, the financial incentives in our country incentivize arresting, incarcerating, and, and, and imprisoning. And we need to break that cycle. And I think we need to create a, a financial system which incentivizes us to keep recidivism down. And if you actually empowered the whole pool of money now that is in the justice system, and I don't know how you would do this, Chuck, but it would seem to me this is the, the real future and the financing piece of this. Um, you could really align incentives. And by the way, it'd be great for Medicaid. It'd be great for how, I mean, it, it, it's part of the siloization of mental health, which creates such a problem for us to see the real value of, of for example, how important supportive housing is for people with uh, severe mental illness. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. And, and, and in, the, in the next question, in keeping in line with the criminal justice theme and certainly much more on a local level, um, a participant said, I know police officers who have demonstrated interest in coordinating a seamless mental health crisis response, but have struggled with information sharing to respond appropriately. Do you have suggestions? I'll jump in here and I apologize, my internet cut out and I lost you guys for a few minutes, but, um, and I hope I'm not repeating anything that was said while I was gone, but I think uh, 988 really provides, um, you know, a connection uh, to law enforcement in a way that we haven't um, had that before. Um, you know, clearly um, law enforcement is, you know, one of the things, one of the goals of 988 is to um, hopefully help uh, divert calls from law enforcement that are going there right now for people who are in mental health crisis. But it's also, in order to do that, uh, we need to work in partnership with law enforcement. And so we're seeing um, states and local communities really engage um, their police officers and, and all, the, all the law enforcement departments uh, in their states and local communities um, in this process where we're convening all the stakeholders together uh, to try to create this um, you know, this seamless uh, system of care where people will have uh, someone to call and some, someone to respond and someone to be there for them so that they can get the care that they need ultimately. And we think that this offers a tremendous opportunity. You know, I know Chuck uh, is, is one of our planning partners. Chuck may have, uh, you know, some, something to say on this as well, but I think, I think this is really a, a, a watershed moment for us uh, in working with law enforcement. Well, maybe I would just say, you know, um, what's that phrase, keep it simple. You know, so, uh, you know, I know uh, places around the country where they have developed, you know, kind of um, um, an email system where the police can send an email to, to the lo local provider uh, who's and say, they have a code to figure out, you know, uh, so that they don't violate HIPAA, you know, do you know this person? And they, they you know, and then they, if, if that person is known to the mental health system, then they have a way of making that referral. So, you know, maybe that's like a low tech 
kind of option. We also know that in parts of the country, uh, mental health providers are giving iPads or other tablets to law enforcement so that when law enforcement shows up at a scene and somebody has a mental health crisis, they can connect them to uh, somebody from the mental health center uh, that way. So there are just, I would say, keep it, you know, be um, flexible and creative, uh, but try not to over overcomplicate things. Yeah, we've also seen, you know, ride-alongs work extremely well, where um, clinicians and peers are doing ride-alongs with law enforcement. Um, that uh, serves a multi-purpose, right? So when they arrive at a scene, um, they can help de-escalate and really help um, make the situation go in the right direction instead of the wrong direction. But it also helps educate those police officers during those ride-alongs. Um, there's hours and hours of time spent um, where police officers and peers or or clinicians get to get to talk back and forth with each other where they may not have had that opportunity to do that. Police officers can ask questions. They can understand the disease concept better. They can understand, um, you know, uh, how to move people across the stages of change. So all the evidence-based tools we have with like motivational interviewing can be um, talked about. And uh, it, it, we, we've heard back from law enforcement that that's been incredibly helpful. Thank you. The next question uh, deals with stigma. Um, it says that uh, stigma is continues to be ever present when it comes to people suffering from mental illness and substance use disorders. And never a day goes by in our country that mental, mental health concerns, especially our youth, are not reported uh, in, 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 in media. It's, we can see it, it's ever present uh, as the question is posed. Um, so the question is, do you think ironically since mental health is discussed at so many more kitchen tables today in our country, at least we hope it is, that one thing that may come out of this pandemic is actually a lessening of the stigma since so many more people are suffering. And I'm gonna throw that out to the audience. Um, this might be the last question we have, so please feel free everyone to, to chime in. Thanks so much. I, I would say you saw us all nodding. I think uh, we definitely feel that this the one the one bright spot out of this is that the stigma is going to be lessened because there's so much awareness about it right now. I do believe that young people are more willing to not only identify but advocate for themselves and when it comes to mental health. You know, Patrick has talked many times about the checkup from the neck up. And if we really want to be able to reduce stigma in the same way students are getting that called down to the nurse's office as my littlest one, Nellie, just got her vision checked at school and told me about, you know, the letters and numbers getting smaller. They need to be getting their mental health checked as well. And that should just be a regular part of every physical, you know, this is your health. It's all part of health. But also being able to have so many access points in places where people are comfortable I think reduces the stigma. So I'll let others jump in. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I agree, Amy. Two things that were amazing came out of the out of COVID pandemic, if there is such a thing. The silver lining being use of telehealth services for, for mental health and substance use services. My God, it's totally changed the game. And the other piece is people are talking about this. And there's, I think there was a recent statistic that one out of two Americans actually are now have a diagnosable mood disorder as a result of what's going on in the pandemic. And I have such great hope for the generation that's up on their way up because they talk about this and they don't have problems. It's not the same as people in my generation or you know, a, few, a few in between. And so it's great hope and it's gonna take all of us and that village as they say, to keep pressing the, the metal here, the you know, pedal to the metal, as they say. Um, but but truly, uh, that's been one of, the, one of the two greatest advantages, I think, that came out of or the silver linings out of the COVID pandemic. I, I got into recovery back in 2003. And over the last 19 years, I have seen an amazing uh, sea change here. But I can't wait for the day when we stop talking about stigma and start talking about discrimination because that is what's really happening here. This is the people, the, the lack of integration that's happening, the name you talked about, that's, that's discrimination. The lack of care that people are receiving, that's discrimination. And so I can't wait for the day when we 
shift that conversation. And Patrick has done an amazing job of talking about this as well uh, throughout his career. So thank you for that, Patrick. Well, Tom, uh, you and I are both great pals of the faces and voices of recovery, which also helps address stigma amongst those of us in recovery who think that our anonymity means that we should not be involved politically or civically in our society. And that, I think, if you, we ever were able to um, harness the 26 million Americans in long-term recovery, we could really smash stigma by smashing those discriminatory uh, patterns and, and do the things that Amy's talking about doing. And I couldn't help but think how my wife should have been elected for Congress last cycle in the second CD here in New Jersey, because if you took a special interest issue, there's nothing bigger to more families than mental health. But during her campaign, and this is just an example of how much further we have to go on stigma or, if you will, coming out and advocating, I, even as a champion of mental health who has loads of connections, could not source mailing lists and groups and political activists in the mental health space in order to facilitate her message about how mental health has to be integrated in schools getting out. And until we harness the political system, we're not going to get good members of Congress who can help break this stuff down, whether they be Republicans or Democrats. What's really essential for all of us, regardless of party affiliation, is we need to get involved in the political process and demand the kind of change that you've heard today in this call um, at all levels of regulation and law which will only happen if we get politically involved. It's not just gonna be Zooms and us talking about solutions. It's gonna be people hitting the ground, organizing, donating to campaigns, getting uh, these things done. And that'll help erase stigma too by normalizing this like every other um, advocacy issue. Thank you, thank you, Congressman. And what a powerful way to end. And um, I, ours is a, a bipartisan issue. And when we see it being politicized, we've got to stand up and we've got to call that out and fight that because there's no place for that. Too many families are suffering. I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the Ascenda Institute's advisory board and all of our participants out there. The comments coming in are unbelievably uh, uh, positive, supportive. People have found this uh, fruitful and a powerful discussion. And, uh, and I would say this, that's our jobs, really. That's our passion. That's our vocation to keep this conversation going and come up with and, and roll out a new vision for behavioral health in the United States, because families, families will benefit greatly. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day and happy St. Patty's Day tomorrow. Thanks, Jim. Take care. Thank Bye -bye you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a good day.